Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. Really excited today speaking with author Mary Gregory. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. Very happy to be here, Mike. So you're working for Live Nation as your day job. Mm-hmm. So I'm a former Ticketmaster guy. So I know a little bit about that. I was there for the like the the early Live Nation purchasing Ticketmaster. So I got I got a little of it. Mm-hmm. I got a little of it. That's uh, it was pretty enjoyable for Ticketmaster, but I enjoyed it before the internet. Internet, to my in my opinion, internet screwed it up because I liked. Yeah, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I was work I was working at the call center back when you had to call in to get tickets. There was no internet. You know, we had like a DOS system on the computer and probably 700 agents in a call center, you know, for a Saturday morning on sale. And it was just fun. You know, you had to move lines around. I I know nobody cares about this stuff, but it was, it was so fun back then. You'd have to, you know, depending on what time an on sale was, you'd move lines around and and just there were, it was very hands-on, a lot of fun. And then a few years later, the internet hit. And then instead of 700 people doing sales, you might have had 50. And everybody else was doing customer service then. Completely changed. Yeah. So back then, you could actually get a ticket on an on sale, potentially. Yes. So the people that would stand in line at the warehouse, you know, like the lines, you know? uh, they actually usually got tickets. So that's right. before the internet. I believe the internet messed it up. I mean, I get it. It's kind of ridiculous to stand in line for 24 hours or something to get tickets, but it, it was kind of cool. Yeah. You know, you put the that. work in, you deserve the tickets. That's so true. Absolutely. I mean, now I'll stand in line a couple hours before a show starts and I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm really rough at it. Like, oh, I can't wait to get in. I'm standing in line. But uh, for a ticket, like you're not even sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People used to talk to each other when they stood in line too. Uh, now oh, yeah. everyone just stares at their phone. So that was also nice. I'm sure. Everybody gets that stuff. We used to stand in line for movies, for certain toys coming out, you know, the, the tickets. That's all we, we spent all our lives just standing in line. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> how long how long have you been with Live Nation? Uh 10 years in April, which is crazy to think Ooh. about. Um, my my whole entire um, corporate career has been at Live Nation. And I actually started on the Ticketmaster side. So, TM. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know. I know. I know. Um, and I was over on that side for about four or five years. And then um, I've been in IT on the corporate side now for six years. Yeah. So, they, they've had me for longer. But... It's all good. We're one big family. Yeah, that's 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 pretty great. It's pretty great. I always, always have had uh, fond memories of my time with uh, Ticketmaster, but I never got to work for corporate. I was I was strictly call centers. You know, that's yeah. uh, uh, my wife Emily and I. That's where we met was in call centers. But then she's mm-hmm. she stuck with it. I moved on. She stuck with it and moved on to corporate, and she's still doing it. She's amazing. Your wife is yeah. amazing. She's pretty good. She's pretty good. She lets me play around with the podcast. So I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> so he's having fun. <laughs> that's right. So so let's start here. Let's start here. Before we we talk about the uh, the book, which is a memoir. Let me, I want to get it right. Travels through Aqua Green and Blue is the book. So before we talk about that, though, tell me a little bit about why you wanted to become an author and and what you did to achieve that. Yeah, um, it was definitely a journey for sure. Um, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have, it took me five years to write the book. And I would say that for every year I was writing it, I would not have said I was even a writer, even while I was writing it. <laughs> it almost <laughs> felt like I had to be published. And then I could say, I wrote a book. So, um, but 
obviously you're a writer, even if you're in the process of writing. So new writers, you're, you're a writer if you're um, putting in the work. Um, right. But what inspired me was I met a lot of people who heard my story and were like, you should write a book. That's incredible. <laughs> no one would ever believe it. And I'm like, yeah, you think so? And like, yes, for sure. And then eventually um, I landed into a um, kind of a crossroads. I was uh, at my at Ticketmaster. I was trying to like move up and get a different role. And I just didn't get the job I was looking for. I was like, really bummed. I was sort of doing that self-reflection and like, what is yep. it about me that is keeping me behind? Um, and I just went on like the scavenging hunt for any personal development book, audio book <laughs> I could find. <laughs> Um, and I was just taking it all in and I found this uh, book called by Hal Elrod called The, the Miracle Morning. And okay. he talks about, I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, super motivational guy. Uh, his story is really amazing and compelling. Like he almost died in a car accident and uh, oh. couldn't walk. And yeah, I got to this point where he got his life together and he was just doing these like really small incremental changes um every day uh and he calls them the lifesavers so it's silence like affirmations yeah it's, it's really approachable visualizations exercise reading and scribing or journaling um 10 minutes each so that's 60 minutes one hour before your workday starts so you actually put in the time to take care of your uh, own personal development before looking at emails checking social media doing all the other things that we do that like kind of it sounds really us. hard. I you wouldn't it, like you you wouldn't think it would be hard. That sounds really difficult. Actually, it was um, the idea of doing it was really difficult because yeah. I was like, "Wow, I'm not really a morning person. I'm not sure how I'm going <laughs> to do this." <laughs> like getting coffee, that's difficult. Right. Um, so you want me to sit down and like ex like exercise? But I did it. I got up. I read the story. I was so motivated and inspired. I woke up at six a.m. the next day. I did the savers, and by nine a.m. or seven a.m., I was like done with my personal development. And I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. Like I actually took time out of my day for this. And uh, I feel so accomplished. And he was right. The first day you do it, you're just kind of hooked. And yeah. um, I did the next day. And then within a few days by journaling and like, you know, basically you're talking to yourself when you're journaling and you get all the <laughs> stuff that's like rolling around in the brain on paper. And I basically um, said, yeah, I'm going to write my story. And it's about time that I do that. And part of that personal development journey was discovering the writer in me. And that's the part that I just really wasn't being myself, uh, truly. Um, I was keeping back parts of me and not addressing childhood trauma right. and all of those things that were like showing up at work or showing up in my personal life. Uh, so I was like, okay, it's time for me to address them. Um, and then I just went on this like journey, uh, if you will, uh, travels through <laughs> writing a book uh, <laughs> for the next few years. But uh, I came out within a, within a year, um, like pretty, pretty much on my way, like um, having addressed uh, trauma, having uh, sought therapy, that was, that's also in the book and uh, talking about an EMDR session that mm -hmm. I had that really cleared a lot of stuff for me. And then I yeah. was like, able to just move on and like get it done. So it was a process. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Did, did just the act of writing before work, did just that help you with your work day? Because I would think it would kind of focus you so that you're, you know, instead of that first hour of work where you're trying to wake up and get going, you're already ready to go. Absolutely. I, it yeah. was just, so, so great because I never had a, like, you know, they say resistance is when you really want to be somewhere else. And like that creates stress because in your mind, you're like, oh, I really would rather be doing this. That's more fulfilling. Well, when you take care of yourself in the morning, you're already like, okay, cool. I already <laughs> listened. I read 10 pages of a self-development book or whatever book I, I wrote, you know, I have some new ideas. I'm like calm. Uh, and then I go into my work day and it's like, okay. I can roll with anything. I'm not trying to be somewhere else. I've already right. done what I needed to do. Yeah, you're myself. focused. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So 
did the act of writing this stuff down, you know, and you're writing about some difficult times in your life, did just that where nobody has read it yet, it's just for you, did that carry over into your regular life? You mean um, just the fact of writing and be becoming a better communicator? Uh, just getting, just getting it that. out. You're getting all of this out and it's on paper. So you're not holding it inside. Even though nobody's read it yet, it's, it's out. Did that help your relationships, you know, in your personal life at work? Did that help? Yes, absolutely. I became someone that like was super scared to have even done a podcast, to have even gotten up and given a presentation <laughs> yeah. to, you know, senior leader in IT reporting to a CIO and, um, you know, amazing doing very well professionally and, and pretty comfortable with doing um, those types of things. So absolutely, um, 100% made a difference. And um, as far as like business communications, uh, just being able to find your voice you know, like sometimes you're writing something, you're like, oh, do I feel comfortable sending this? Um, I just became more and more comfortable with like, oh, well, what I'm thinking and what I'm writing, I'm aligned with. And I that carried over in business as well. Yeah, that, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. Okay, so so let's let's get into it a little bit. Travels through aqua green and blue. Let's start with the name. How did you come up with the name? I have to give total 100% credit to my brother. He gave me the name for this book and it is the best name there ever was. Uh, I had a couple of uh, names I was working on and I decided to finally send it to a group of people in a chat. And I was like, what do you guys think of this uh, title, subtitle? And my brother is on this thread and he doesn't chime in at all everyone's like oh that's great or maybe put a twist here a twist there and then all of a sudden he just pops in he's like travels through aqua green and blue and then it gets out of the chat it just drops that mic and I was like ah I knew exactly what it meant too it was so crazy he he nailed it so my mother when we left Nashville bought a 67 aqua colored uh dodge dart Yep. <laughs> and you know it was the mid 80s so it was, we were already classic at that time and she just over the years over traveling through uh you know new york and nevada and california when we left uh nashville the color of the car faded uh to green <laughs> and blue and it just i was like wow that's so amazing the title fits completely and my editor had been telling me, um, I had talked about being a chameleon in the book. And, you yeah. know, she said, you should really write, uh, add a little more to that in the book. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, chameleons change their color. They change from aqua, green and blue. And those things also mean something to chameleons. And I incorporated that and separated three parts of my book for the colors to represent a chameleon as well as the, the fading of the colors uh, of my mom's car. So <laughs> it was perfect. I love, I love that. I think it's very unique. Yeah. I, I, I love the, uh, love the title. So, so talk a little bit about what the book's about, you know, it started back in the eighties in Nashville and, and it was quite the journey to get, to get to here. So, so let's talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm the youngest of three. Uh, my brother, he's the oldest. And uh, when I was born, I was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. Uh, yes. So many, many surgeries later, voila. Uh, but definitely looked very different than uh, most people. And I really didn't know how different I looked until other people told me, <laughs> to yeah, be honest course. with you. Yeah, of course. People you are know? so helpful. Yeah, so super helpful. when did when did the surgery start? How old were you? So I was three months old when I had okay. my uh, first surgery. Um, yeah. So still pretty tiny. And I would have shown a picture. I don't have it up, but there's a picture of me, of, you know, just born, maybe a month old. And, you know, when you're born with a cleft of a pat in palate, like a lot of the skin kind of 
bulges out when you're a baby. Right. And so back in the 70s, I was born in 78, they would just lop that off and then tighten everything uh, up. So you'd have like these two vertical scars. Um, and then my palate, you know, was sewed up to a, an extent. I still had a little hole um, in there. And nowadays they don't do that. Like they keep everything. And then yeah. it's really like a mastery, you know, of figuring out where it should go. And then most kids born with what I have, you can barely see uh, really any difference. Uh, a lot of my surgeries later in life were to like replace what they took out. So, uh, you know, bone grafts and, you know, cartilage from my ear, back of my ears and things really? like that to just kind of rebuild everything. Yeah. Um, amazing. So it, it took, yeah, it takes a lot of work now, but now, or then, but nowadays, you know, um, if you are, do have a child born with that, you know, it, repairing it is not really that, that difficult. Uh, but the, the reason why the journey started, that's just one element I'll, I'll start with because it kind of matters later in life uh, for me. But yeah, my, my parents had been married for 14 years, had three kids. My father was the preacher of our church. Uh, my mother was like a stay-at-home mom, taking care of the three kids. Um, and then my dad came out of the closet and oh. it was quite the news. It was in the local paper. Um, you know, you can imagine that like society at that time, which I like 84, um, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. People were freaked right. out to say the least. Uh, and so was our family, you know, they, they, they didn't know how to handle that. Um, so she wasn't getting, my mother was devastated and she wasn't getting any support from anybody. And, um, she was already suffering with the first signs of, uh, paranoid schizophrenia. And this was probably just that, that break, uh, for I her. I think that's the, yeah. that's the most difficult part when you, when you hear the beginnings of this story is just the fact that because of the time period and the environment that, that uh, we were growing up in at that time, there was no support. You know, nobody was, yeah. was trying to, to help, you know, and, and you know, now, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at that, thankfully, we're looking at those situations differently, you know, and it's, it's almost, you know, you're, you're wanting everybody to be true to themselves. Wasn't that case, you know, 40 years ago? Oh, I, I mean, she was in the closet, right? With having depression and, and not yeah. able to come out and talk about what was going on. And it was like a real fear for women to be hysterical and lose their yeah. kids. And um, she was, yeah, she was coming unhinged for sure. But um, yeah, couldn't did your, get treatment. Did your father, did he choose to come out or, or did something ha did something occur? Yeah, he actually chose to come out. Okay. Uh, he had, I later learned from him in my 20s that, uh, you know, he was always remained a religious man. And he just felt like he had tried to have a family and that the feelings he had towards men was just a test uh, to see if he could be true to God. And uh, he finally was just like, I got to be true to myself. You know, he was in his early 40s. Uh, he had found his community and he was like, I, you know, like they were telling him to come out and, you know, he wanted to be out and I'm glad he was true to himself, but it definitely changed the entire trajectory of my life. That's <laughs> why just, I'm in, in here in California. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's such a, it's, 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 it's such an interesting story because obviously he was struggling probably most of his life. With, with this yeah. and, and trying to figure himself out. And I'm sure it wasn't his intention to, to cause problems for your mother, right. but you know, I'm not sure what the right answer would be there because you're, he's, he's in a situation where, you know, you're, you're kind of, it's kind of lose, lose. Absolutely. And I don't think he ever in a million years, nor did my did the families on both sides think my mom would do what she did? So yeah. I don't think, you know, like when you're thinking of like risk and you're like, oh, well, if I say this or do this, this is likely what's going to happen. It was just not even on the table. Like no one 
thought that she would do what she did. Um, and so he struggled. Um, I learned when I finally got back in touch with him 13 years later is when I wow. saw him again. Uh, how devastated he was like he'd had a couple of mental breakdowns um he just wasn't the same man if uh, my brother ended up going back to tennessee when he was 18 as soon as he could met him and he's like man if you had met dad just a few years ago uh he had just a completely different personality but he had a you know they were they were doing electric shock treatment on him uh oh and that they don't even do that again anymore no. i don't think so it's just like all of these societal um, stigmas and issues just can truly wreck, you know, families. And, um, I'm glad we're getting, we're getting better. Let's just say that I'm really, yeah. Glad. Yeah. So, 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 so this, this happens with your dad, you know, what, how did your mom react that, that caused you to be separated for such a long time? Yeah, one one day, so they tried visitation, you know, and, and all of that yeah. stuff and um, did it. It was not working out what my dad would pick us up and have us for an afternoon, maybe take us to Shoney's, you know, yeah. and then uh, drop us back off. And then the phone calls would start like my mom would be calling him endlessly. Or I write about this in the book. I slip and say that that they're one of his boyfriends with that at the house, like, oh, the brown man was there when we got there. And uh, I, I, I was like six, sorry, sorry, daddy -o. Uh, And yeah. so, you know, they, she loved him. They loved each other still, you know, in their own way. Right. Obviously they had three kids together. He wanted to be a dad. Um, so he loved us. It's just, um, they, it, it was not good. So basically after, after that and her being a stay at home mom, we were really just in poverty. Like we yeah. were living off like $300 of child support per month. And she had the house and, you know, the roof was leaking and we were eating, you know, we were starting to have to go to food banks, uh, and, you know, get food from the church, things like that. So she decided one day she bought this car, that 67 Dodge Dart rolled up in our gravel driveway and said, okay, like we're leaving. And it was, she's like, go in and grab whatever you want. And for me, I was thinking, eh, you know, like I didn't even go inside. I was like, I don't want to say goodbye to the house, you know, um, but we're not going to be going too far, but no, she, she, it was for real. And wow. um, we left and we sort of did this journey to all of these relatives houses on our way out. But um, yeah, we left and then ended up in New York for a short yeah. period of time. Yeah, that's, 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 I, it's, I can't imagine at such a young age, I mean, you had to just be like, what is going on? You know, because you had to just be disoriented by that. Totally, and, and of course, you know, as a kid, you, you love your mom, right? So I was like, yes. okay, well, road trip, I guess that's what we're doing. Um, but we had no means. And so even when we got in New York, uh, we had to get traveler's aid, uh, we had we were offered to sleep in a mission that night it was yeah. freezing uh, we didn't sleep in it because there was just so many men there like uh that there was just my mom's like this is not going to happen with three kids and so we slept in our car and ended up sleeping in our car much of the time that we were there we would get hotel rooms if we got vouchers my mom found little jobs here and there but um you know the first time I ever really experienced uh, being bullied was in New York, uh, yeah. you know, going to the number 17 school, public school, and then um, PS 17. And my teacher just saying, well, you look different. You must be like mentally impaired um, oh my and God. treated me like I was the lowest of the lowest kids. And of course we were poor. So we didn't look good. Uh, my clothes were not the, you know, looking good either, but yeah. I, there was just a lot of pre prejudice uh, for me and the impact on me because not only did the teacher treat me bad poorly, but students picked up on that obviously. Um, and so it made it just doubly difficult uh, to be experiencing all of this stuff, being teased and, but also having all these feelings about like, Hey, I miss my dad. And like, I sure. miss, you know, my family and being back in the house and just being a kid. Now it's like survival. And we were, I, we, I've stayed in poverty until I was married. 
uh, when I turned 17. So that's, you know, from six to 17, we were, we were always on welfare and always on, you know, public assistance or whatnot. So it was a difficult, difficult period. And, and like, I didn't see my father until I was 19. So it was a long period of time to be uh, in that situation with no support from family. So like when people take yeah. their kids away, uh, from parents and support systems, you know, you just think about how much help you give, you know, yeah. your kids and, and, you know, like as my brother says, every phone call is $300, you know, from your kid. And it's like, <laughs> um, it's true. And she just, she wouldn't accept any help from anybody, not even her family. Like, so she, we were always kind of running away from them. So that's how we ended up in like Nevada, um, from New York and then went to California. Well, what, so were they, was your family around. attempting to find you? Yeah, so I've heard that, that they, they were. Yeah, I found out later my grandmother um, had some sources and would locate my mom here and there and would send her money. And I do remember when I was like maybe 11 or 12, uh, my mom getting a check uh, for Christmas, which was like $30 from our grandmother. And she got, you know, was able to get a letter through to my mom saying like that my grandfather had passed because he had Parkinson's. And um, yeah. I write about that too, too, you know, just being around your grandparents is, you know, um, and seeing some of the stuff that they're going through, you, you that hurt too, not having been around really yeah. uh, for so long. And yeah, so they were getting through, but she had finally like planted herself in here in Long Beach, California, where I still live actually. And uh, she wasn't planning on, on moving. So as, as, as soon as we all got old enough or emancipated, we all sort of like, we moved out and, and kind of yeah. got in touch with our dad and try to make connections with family. When, how old were you when you, when you kind of knew that when, as soon as you were able, you were going to try to find your dad? You know, I'll thank my husband for this because it had been so long since we'd talked to anybody in the family, to be honest, yeah. I wasn't in the, mo I never had this like sense that I had family, you know, it just, I right. never, it's just my brother and sister, my mom and I, and then I, I was 19. I'd been married for a year, two years. And my husband's like, why don't we just look up your dad? Like, let's just find him in the white pages. And he <laughs> went online thanks internet and he found he looked him up and there was like two or forget three everything records. i said about the internet it's the best <laughs> <laughs> exactly um and i first number i called it wasn't him the second number uh i got his roommate who said oh he's at church but i'll let him know you called and uh call back in a couple of hours and i did and it was my dad it, it was the first time i talked to him since i was six and it was, it was really amazing. And he was, he was happy to hear from me. And um, I was also like out of touch with my brother because he moved back there and I didn't know where he was living. And uh, I later learned he'd moved in with our dad, but uh, yeah, it just, it was like, oh my, it, it felt so incredible that like within a month I was in Nashville visiting him. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So how, you know, how was your mother's mental state through the years, did, did things stay about the same or did, did she kind of deteriorate as you got older? It absolutely got worse and worse. Uh, you know, it's terrible uh, for someone to be untreated um, with that kind of mental yeah. illness or any mental illness over time. It just gets worse and worse. And, um, you know, basically basic hygiene was off the table. Um, she never was clean, you know, uh, yes. never taking consistent baths or showers or anything like that. Um, never combing her hair. She had these, like, we would call it a rat nest. My hair kind of looks like a rat nest right now, but <laughs> no, <it does> not. <laughs> she, had, she had these like dreadlocks. I mean, dreadlocks, um, because she didn't, uh, comb her hair and we would just sit there sometimes and, you know, comb it out for her, um, cleaner clothes. I can wash cleaner clothes for her. Yeah. Um, it was a struggle and she didn't make any friends because if she'd meet anybody and they were too nice uh, to her or us, then they were trying to get something from her, you know? And yeah. so it was really a rough uh, experience because we couldn't, um, we couldn't like get through to her, you know, on a consistent basis that like, no, that person's not trying to do this, 
you know, or no, um, they're not trying to steal your information uh, before the internet, you know, it's like, uh, it just got worse and worse. And she would have these like outbursts, you know, we, we could wake up in the middle of the night and she's screaming at us for something, you know, she would take it out on us. And it was just kind of like this chaos at, at all the time. And then there would be the real low lows where she'd just be crying in her bed, you know, and just like, I'm a terrible parent. I'm awful. And, you know, yeah. I can't provide for you. And then I'd try to make her feel better, you know, like, no, you're not terrible. You're not this, you know, but I didn't have the, I would tell her that she was paranoid, but I didn't have the vocabulary, you know, or right. the experience to say you should get treatment. It wasn't until I was like, a teenager, you know, and meeting people who were getting treatments that I could talk about that, you know, and say, mom, you should see somebody. Uh, and I did that later. Um, but it definitely was too late. You know, she, it, she, the paranoid schizophrenia had been going on for so long that um, it was going to be very, very difficult for her to get treatment. Um, and yeah. then when she did get treatment, we were already not talking anymore. Like, uh, I later just... learned that she got to get some, but yeah, uh, we weren't talking at that time. That's yeah, that's that's terrible. So now that you're now that you're older, you know, how do you mm -hmm. process, you know, those those feelings? Do you have, you know, resentment towards your parents, towards the the church? You know, are you does it make you sad? Is it is it, you know, are you looking at it as you wouldn't be where you are without the trials you went through? You know, how do you process that now? Yeah. I definitely have no resentment towards my parents. I, what was really wonderful about writing the book was that I was around the same age my mom was when she left Tennessee. So I was able to understand in a way, like what, what 30 something felt like. And, um, you know, at the time I was going through difficulties myself and I was trying to get a different job and doing this right. personal discovery and my, um, personal relationship, my marriage needed work. So there was like all this stuff kind of coming together at the same time that I was like, you know, like it must've been really difficult for her to, to have three kids and have a husband that you've been married to for 14 years and come out and like completely yeah. change your life upside down and not, not get mental services and, and all that stuff. It's just, and no one having compassion for her uh, at that time or understanding how to, I was like, that's, that really, really sucks. Years before I did have resentment and all of the, I just couldn't put myself, I was just like, how selfish was she to like, take us away from everybody. But, you know, pe I've later learned like people operate out of fear. You know, a lot of people are operating out of fear and they do crazy things. Um, sure. and she was just always in that constant fear and, I, I've been in that, you know, and it's like, okay, I remember just kind of feeling really lost and uh, not sure how things were going to work out for me versus um, now, like having written it and like gotten all the stories out, gotten, you know, uh, therapy and learning about um, EMDR sessions and yeah. tapping and somatic healing and all these other things. It's like, I, I'm in a great place and I can tell people about how to um, forgive. And, you know, that's actually going to be the, the topic of my second book is just like being able to see the silver linings in your life and to grow from them. And one of the big things is forgiving other people, but first forgiving yourself. Like what, you know, yeah. what was I going through at that time, any time in your life? Um, and what was my perspective? Uh, can I forgive myself for that? When you can start to do that, you can forgive others. You can say like, where were they coming from? You know, what was their world like? Uh, and I can, I can forgive them for making the choices that they made. Um, so yeah, it really changed a lot for me, uh, writing it and just seeing all of those different angles really made yeah. my whole life make sense. And I was like, okay, I did have like a, a destiny. I'm a writer now, you know, that whole journey of, go, you know, getting it out and processing it and finding forgiveness that's in the book. And so when other people read that, they can, you know, feel inspired and get hope uh, for their own, you know, life. So that's what I would like the book to do and how, how it should help people. I, I think that's, that's, that's so amazing. And, and I love how positive you are and, and where a lot of people, I think, 
with that type of um, background, that environment, you're gonna, they they would let it defeat them. And you've never done that. I, I think that's it's okay. really um, amazing. And now you're sharing the story so that you can help other people because you know there's others struggling. May not be exactly the same, but they're struggling. And and if you can overcome it, someone else could overcome it. I, I just think that's really amazing. Thank you. Do you, when you look back, what about yourself have you, on a positive level, have you inherited from your mother? Definitely the creative side, the silly side. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Really? Yeah. She just got that. Yeah. Yeah, she She had like this really infectious, awesome smile when she was happy, like just beamed, uh, love to laugh, love to be silly when she was in that positive mode, you know, like I could get her to laugh. Uh, generally I was like the yeah. little clown in the family. Um, but yeah, she would always, uh, support any creative thing I wanted to do. Like just always would tell me like, Oh, you can do anything. You're so smart. Like what, whatever you're, <laughs> thing you could pop up in your mind like oh yeah you know I want to do a talent show with the kids in the the apartment building she's like yeah do it you know um so that was always nice and inspiring and helpful so I I definitely got that from her you know that fun light-hearted spirited like go get go get it you know adventurous type personality do you when you look back, are you able now to to look at some of the the good times the positive things yeah, absolutely. I was just doing it right now, thinking about her. Like, what did yeah. I get from her? Um, absolutely. There was there was a lot of times um, just close closeness, you know, like yeah. we, just little little moments we would have uh, together um, make me think about that. And just to be honest, I think about my sister right now and thinking about the times that we would just, you know, sing together and yeah. our voices harmonized really, really well together. And we were walking home from school and no one picked us up, you know, we walked <laughs> those 10 blocks with no shoes uphill. Uh, and, but you know, those were, those were character um, building moments. So. Right. Yeah, we were, That's pretty great. Are talking. you, are you still close with your siblings? Well, um, definitely still close with my brother. Um, yes. One of the tragedies of all of this too, is that there's, I no longer have a relationship with my sister. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, it's kind of hard to get away from that type of environment without having some scars. Uh, And so when I wrote the book, it was mostly done. I was having family members like kind of read through it and see if we need to change any names. (laughs) Uh, And basically uh, I reached out to her and I was like, hey, you know, it's been 13 years. And I talk about the incident in the book of like why we're no longer talking and and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's been 13 years. It was 13 years since I saw my dad. Kind of want to like put the olive branch out there. I hope you and your girls are doing well. And it was definitely a hard no. Uh, it was, we're, we're very different. She, she's got a different personality than me. Um, and she's done great with her life and is very accomplished. And, um, but it's very painful to like being around her siblings. So there is unfortunately not a relationship there. However, if she ever did want a relationship, you know, I'm here, but I'm not going to force the door. The door is open. The door is open. But yeah, I know what that's like. You know, our mom ran away from family. Uh, we we learned that. And we all have that. We can all kind of like, if something doesn't go our way, we can kind of like shut it out, out you know? Um, yeah. And so I understand. So I'm trying to meet her where she's at, you know? When you're, when you're feeling down, when you're, when you're mm-hmm. low, you know, are you able to recognize you know, triggers or, or things that, that maybe, you know, you've gotten from, from family that enables you to turn that back around without it becoming a serious issue. I I probably said that terrible, but does that make sense? No, no. Yeah, no, I know before like spiraling down to, yes, I I've definitely figured out a way, um, to see that I'm on the grieving train is what I call it. Uh, you know, you like get on and you're like, why didn't this person email me back or this or that, or I wish 
you know, I, I didn't have this going on or I'm stressed or whatever. Um, I'm able to identify like, whoa, um, either that's not real, <laughs> uh, you know, yes. like, you know, conversation that you wish you had, you had said something, right. you know, those are past situations. Um, I'm better able to say, oh, I'm on the grieving train. Like I am going to step off the rails um, and save myself all of this energy because it's a, it takes a <laughs> lot of energy to like sure. get on that train. Um, and honestly, I saw my mother, you know, like getting on the grieving train a lot. And I yeah. did recognize that at an early age, like that it there was something wrong. Um, right. And I would personally try to get her out of it, you know, uh, talk her through it, things like that. So I kind of do the pep talk myself, but I also have a good support system. I have my husband, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, hashtag cat mom uh, as well. So yep. there's other ways, but um, no, I think that it's really important for people to recognize if you're getting consistently on it and it's difficult and it's difficult and you feel like you're really low, being able to talk to somebody professional, yeah. you know, yeah. about what's going on. I think that they're, it's really helpful. I have people I talk to um, professionally, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's where there's a lot of stress in the society. There's a lot of things like we can't get away from or right. things that you know, start adding up and uh, can get overwhelming, but just kind of recognizing like what's real, what's not real um, and getting really good at pinpointing it. Like, Oh, am I, am I ruminating on something? Is that, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and actually big part of like journaling for me is getting all of that stuff out of my head. So if, you know, like I said, it's like a sane way to talk to yourself. Like no one's going to have a problem with you just journaling. And, but it just really helps. It just gives me perspective um, and it'll help pull me out, you know, of a, a darker place or a lower place if, if I need it. Yeah, that's terrific. That's terrific. One of, I, th I think the part about your writing that, that I love the most is, especially for somebody that's fairly new to writing, even though it took you five years. He's still faster than George Martin. I'll just say that. Still faster than George. He's he still ain't got that new book out yet. But what I really love of, about your writing is that you're so descriptive. I mean, when you're reading through the book, it's almost like you're you're there. It's very um, very vivid. It's very descriptive, very vivid. And I think that's the part for me that is is the best. Thank you, thank you. Um, there is. <sighs> It's so crazy when I, when I do write, I, I really love to just be there. Yeah. Like I, I, I will actually write a little bit and then I'll read it to myself out loud and somehow reading it out loud. I, I like, it's like you get the wave of how you're feeling and, and you can kind of just go on a journey with all of the words and, uh, it, it allows me to go like, did I feel like I was in that space the entire paragraph or a couple of pages? Because I love that when I'm reading to be absolutely captivated. Right. Um, and so I, I picked apart all of the things that I felt and tried to add that into the, the paragraph so that yeah. you really did genuinely feel like you're, you're, in, you're in there. Right there. So I appreciate that. That's definitely what I was aiming to do. Um, yeah. I want you to feel like you're like peering over me as I'm writing it and you get, you get to see like the moment, you know, you're in that moment. That's exactly how it felt. And at times, I mean, absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, just, just tore you apart. But I thought as you're reading through the book, it's, it, it almost has like a positive undertone, you know, so that, you know, by the time you reach the end, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. It's kind of like a cleansing, positive feeling, if that, if that makes sense. But you get that as you read through the book and you're reading some just stuff that's just absolutely heartbreaking, but it never takes you down a negative path, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think because, um, you know, I was a kid when a lot of this stuff was going on, right? Yeah. And um, I wanted to have fun. I wanted to be adventurous, you know, here I am in a strange place or town or whatever, but I still wanted to go like find snakes with my brother, uh, you know, <laughs> or 
uh, run around. And um, so I, I guess it wasn't all bad either, you know, and I think that that's what I, I was, you know, when I, before I wrote it, some things in my life, the memories were all bad. And then when I sat down though, I was like, no, there was all this other stuff. This, there was yeah. all these positive things and those have a place in my um, history as well. And so I, I kind of feel like I balanced it because it, yeah, for sure. in some ways I wanted my life to be balanced. I really did want it to not be so dark, you know, like my home life might have been like a very dirty house and no food. But when I stepped outside, I could be anything with the kids. That's like right. I could play jump rope and I could just be a kid. So I really forced myself to keep a balance growing up as much as I could. Yeah, I, I think that's that's so terrific. So you also dabble in poetry as well? I do. I do. Yeah. Yes. I say I write poetry on, uh, on the back of my book because I was too afraid to say I'm a poet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but I will say, yes, I, I, I am a poet. And if you're I, a, to I was going to say, if you're a writer, because you're writing, you're a poet. If you're writing poetry, I think. Exactly. See, I'm coming into my own. Uh, yes, I love it. And actually, I had written some poems here and there as a kid, you know, or young adult. But as I was writing the book, I was so inspired. I mean, I, I was just yeah. churning out poetry because I was tapped into this place. Yes, it was like, whoa, I have all of these emotions and this feeling and flow within me. And like, it was easy to get some words out and like yeah. dark concepts, but like in a way that we're uplifting. And I just wrote a lot of poetry that you can find on my website, urbanodesty.com. Yeah. And um, work, work my work dating back to like 2018, which seems like a thousand years ago. But yeah, I, I, I and I incorporated poetry in my uh, book as well. Like there are some poems per se in there, but then there's also a flow um, in the book that I feel is poetic. And that's what I was also yeah. trying to achieve yeah and I think you you totally did that's that's the the feeling I got it was it was it felt like someone that understands and writes poetry was writing the book I thought you did a really good job with that very uh very beautiful in places I thought thank you yeah, yeah. so let's let's talk just just quick when you were growing up you know and you were in school and I know you switched schools a, a few different times I mean were you were you writing? Were you were you in band? Did you play sports? What did you do through school? Totally loved sports, played sports. I did yeah. everything sports. Um, big basketball player, uh, loved it. Track and field, uh, high jump, long jump, uh, everything. I, I was just such a little rugrat. Uh, just yeah. any any sport that that was my sanity was playing. Honestly, it was, it allowed me to get out of the house and, and do that. But um, yeah, that was my main, you know, sport, my main thing, honestly. I mean, I did write, um, I would write little short stories uh, yeah. with my best friend and, and, and swap those around and, and all of that stuff. But mostly it was sports and, and I'm glad because that did, that just, I belonged to something. It was, it was nice to be part of a team and yeah. go you know in that little rivalry like the being on the on the team no one ever bullied me like no one on my team bullied me right so right. it was like a, finally like a little pocket I could go to where no one was making fun of my face you know and it it was really 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 uh important to me and kind of built, helped build my confidence so then when I was out there around everybody else in school or in life getting insulted um it was a lot easier for me to take i could just you know bing you know that's ping right. it off of me because i had something else going on so yeah i think that's that's pretty great so how has your family taken the book yes you know what positively uh everyone has really really loved it my brother loved absolutely loved it uh he he was like man I didn't even remember catching snakes in the park but yeah then when you when you wrote about it I, I remember all this stuff 
And uh, he also helped uh, me kind of refine a couple of things that I had remembered around him leaving um, yeah. Long Beach and going uh, first to live with one of our aunts in Texas and then ending up going to Nashville to, to be with our dad. So it was nice to get a little feedback from him. So I was like, you know what, let me add a little uh, some of those details into the book to kind of help uh, make it more real. And then my aunts um, were also very helpful uh, because they gave me some tidbits about the family history uh, that I could add to the book. Uh, but yes, uh, everyone except for my brother said, change my name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was like, no problem. Uh, yeah. But yeah, my, one of my aunts is a lawyer. The other is also a writer. Um, and they read it and they were just like, this is so great. Like you captured Absolutely. the like with diff you know how difficult life was but in a way that was positive and th they were like this makes us feel better because we always wondered about you guys all those yeah. years and always tried to reach your mom and always hoped that you guys were okay and to read your book and know what you went through but like we could kind of feel like we were there you know and yeah. kind of just so you know, we were thinking about you that entire time. And just I mean, it seems like that, that kind of helped to reconnect a little bit. And there's probably some validation there too, that you're getting, you know, from your family that, and just that knowing that they were actually thinking about you at the time, you know, they just, they just didn't know how to help. Yes. And that's really, that's just so sweet. Cause like, even growing up, I always felt like there was just like a little bit of magic, you know, in my yeah. life. I, I don't know why, just like some moments in life, like, you know, one in particular that I was like, okay, someone's got to be watching out for me. Uh, like, you know, we were looking for bottles and cans like we did when we lived in New York and <laughs> I put, we needed some money and I just saw some woman throw something in the trash can. I just said, okay, let me just go over there and look in the trash can. I put my hand in the trash can, pull it out. It's $10. It's a $10 bill. Like yeah. just little stuff like that. Like, wow, that really happened at the right time. You know, like maybe Amazing. the family's looking out for us. Uh, but yeah, that did bring us closer because then they, we could share, commiserate. Um, yeah. They could, now we can have a deeper bond because I didn't grow up around them. Um, and the only time I really saw them again, now we have a relationship, but, uh, was when my mother passed away and, right. um, yeah. And she, by the time that she passed away, she was living in her car, um, and not on medication and, um, the heat wave of 2007 came through Southern oh. California and she was one of the first, um, like maybe five people to die from that heat wave. Uh, so she was found in her car. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. That's terrible. Was, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think she would say about this book? Hmm. That's a good question. I think she would say that she loves it and that she's sorry. I think that, that she'd probably read it and be like, I'm so sorry. I put you through that. Um, you know, let's all I ever wish for her is that she had had an experience where she wasn't troubled, you know. Yeah. Like, so I think if she were to come back and see it now, she'd be an untroubled person and happy, yeah. you know, like happy uh, and, and be really proud of me. Definitely. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That's so that's so great. When you first went back and saw your dad in person, anything that he said to you at that time that stuck with you? Well, the part about telling me um, that, you know, coming out, like why he came out, like he, he realized like how difficult yeah. it had been for us and for him. And um, just him saying like, you know, I tried as long as I could not to, to come out. Like, I just want you guys to know that. And, and just telling me like, he was so happy to be our dad. Like it was never like he never wanted to be our dad. Like he always just wished that we were around and he could still have played that role. You know, that really meant a lot to me because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure for a long time if like, he was like, great, now I don't have kids, you know, like, okay, whatever. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I just didn't know. <laughs> you had doubts, sure. Yeah, I had doubts. And um, no, that changed a lot for me because I was like, oh man, it changed my perspective. Like, yeah, he can be gay and he can be, be want to be a dad. 
it sounds right. silly to say that now because I, but I was 19 and I'd had only been in like my mother's sphere as far as like right. what she said, what kind of man she, he was and what his intentions were. But um, no, it was really, really nice to, to hear that and to say like, okay, yeah, like I was always wanted again, someone else, you know, a family member thinking about me and wanting to, you know, it, it struck me with the book that both of your parents loved you in, in their way and mm -hmm. they wanted good things for you. Just the, the, the situation just, it, I mean, it was nuts. You know, it, it really got out of hand kind of quickly. Yeah, absolutely. It did. Um, and just the, the definitiveness of the running away, you know, right, like it's right. really crazy how it like, it became so definitive so quickly, rather like as I was a kid, I was thinking we're going to turn back, right? Like, you know, at yeah. some point, this is crazy. We can't It's live. just temporary. Yeah, it's just temporary. We can't be like eating out of soup kitchens and um, barely or living out of hotels and eating out of dumpsters like that can't continue. Um, yeah. and yeah, it was just like, yes, this is continuing. And then, you know, of course, by the time I was like in junior high or well in fourth grade, actually middle school, I was like, okay, yeah, we're not going back. And then it was just like a whole nother thing. You know, it was like, well, that's my dad, but it's like that, you know, Tennessee, yeah. Nashville, that's a, that was a, a, a different life. And then this is, this is my new life. And then just sort of like learning how to operate in this new life. Um, that became what it was, you know? Uh, yeah. So reincorporating with the family now through, through the deaths of my parents. I mean, I, I finally, you know, when they pass is when I like got back in touch, you know, with my aunts uh, because we right. took our mother's ashes to Tennessee to be buried uh, next to her father. And then for my dad, he died a year later after my mom um, from a stroke and I got in touch with his side of the family and by having his funeral. And so it's kind of interesting um, that that's how I got back in touch with my family um, was yeah. through their passings. Well, I, I, your story is, I, it's absolutely amazing. It's the type of story that you would watch at a movie theater or, or on TV. I mean, you, and you wouldn't think that it's, it's real actually happened to you it's, it's just amazing and I think it's it's such an inspiration how far you've come and how you've used that uh, to kind of uh, spur you on and, and to bring something positive out of it will we get to see this on a, a small screen or a big screen sometime at some point you know that's a good question uh, I have dabbled in screenwriting I co-wrote um, a tv series uh, before the pandemic. So Ooh. again, all of this inspirational stuff. Yes. Um, it was with a group of folks all remote and uh, this yeah. guy had had an idea for a TV series um, for 15 years and just needed a writer. Uh, and so someone connected me with him and I said, well, I've never written a screenplay or anything like that, but uh, I got, I bought final draft, I, you know, uh, saved the cat. I was doing everything I could to, to learn, to learn it and really, really loved it. And we pitched it a couple of times, uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, we didn't get, we didn't get it picked up. Um, however, that's definitely an interest of mine. Uh, I'm currently a free agent. So, uh, looking to nab a literary agent, but looking to get into that, but also continuing writing books. Um, yeah. but yes, I, I I have well, a lot of people who have read it said, okay, this needs to be a movie. Uh, so I don't know if I'm the right one to do it, <laughs> but maybe someone out there is. I mean, it, to me, it just screams movie. So who, who plays you? Oh man. Yeah. You got anybody in mind? I don't. I mean, I would say if it was like 10 years ago, maybe Uma Thurman or something, that'd be rad. <laughs> But that'd be, be my Uma adult. Thurman could pull it off. That would be pretty great. <laughs> oh man. Um, someone said for my mom, um, oh God, I'm I'm spacing on her name. I'm gonna get it for you in a second. But um there's a couple of people I would I would have to think about who's gonna play me, actually, because it's like the little me. Yeah, you and, have to uh, have the different stages of you. 
you have to have the little different stages and like, you know, who's going to look cute with like a, you know, some scars on their lip. I don't know. Maybe some kids could really pull it off. I think that'd be oh, yeah. actually pretty awesome um, to show children with cleft lip and palettes on the screen. And um, Oh, that'd be great. I think that would be great. You know, that's what next, when you come back, that's what we'll have to do. We'll cast the movie. Okay. Let's cast the movie. <laughs> That'll be my hope. <laughs> That'd be my homework because now I'm like going through all of these people. You caught me uh, off guard, but that would be that would be rad. It would be really amazing to see that, and um, I would love to work with somebody on that. Just yeah. getting the ideas out because what are you talking? I mean, there's you know the book is 420 something pages or 40 pages, so yes. there's a lot in there, and so it'd be interesting to see like what what sticks, like what that. Yeah, that movie storyline is. You have any ideas off the no, top of your head? No, but well, there's a lot. I got a lot of ideas about what should stick, but there's so many. And I'll say good, but but not all of it is good experiences, you know. But the the writing's so good that would just be terrific, I think, in a movie and helpful. You know, I think there's a lot in there that you could do a movie that would, you know people watching it, it would help, you know, they would see some of these struggles and it would open up, yeah. you know, a dialogue where people could actually, you know, they may be having similar yeah. issues in their own family, but it would spur them to actually talk about it and do something about it. And I, I, there's just a lot of really positive things, but it could also work yeah. as a series and you could get a lot more of those in there. Hmm. Interesting. That's true. You know, I mean, I know we didn't hit on a lot of the specifics. I think the uh, um, kind of the picketing outside the church would definitely be something that you'd have to have in either one series yeah. or, or a movie because it was so impactful and, and painful. That was that to me, that may have been the most painful section, you know, or story. It's that very, very difficult, but important, I think. Yeah, I agree. That was one of the big turning points uh that awakening you know like you're in kid mode and then you're like transferred into like adult mode yeah. and like you're way stuck too soon in the situation way too soon uh yes i agree the picketing would definitely have to stay in for yeah, sure have to stay um, in it's mm -hmm. yeah and that's like i said that's when my colors were changing when i'm like referencing the chameleon <laughs> uh like real changes happened in that moment uh, yeah. and personality and, and situation and understanding and worldview and all of that stuff. It was, yeah, pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. So Mary, this has been just a delight. It's, I've, I've been so excited to, to talk to you and Emily absolutely loves it. She raved about this book and, and I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. And she's like, you should have her on the show. And I was like, I should. That's it's, it's been on it. awesome with you. Yeah, this has been the Did you do an audio version of the book? I did. Yes, it's on Audible. Um, so you can get that there. Uh obviously Kindle and paperback. It's on Did you um, do the reading? You get did you is it your voice? I did not do my voice. And the reason why is because I am not as good. <laughs> as the woman I hired to do the recording, I hired a professional and she did a fantastic job. And I think it would have been really hard for me to get through some of those moments. It yeah. Probably like 20 takes or something. Uh, and she just brought such a beauty um, to the whole the whole book and just when I met her, she was just so down to earth and, and kind yeah. and loved the story and, and read the book and was like, okay, yeah, I, I definitely know where I need to come from for this. And I appreciated that 110%. Uh, yeah, she did a sure. fantastic job. Yeah, that's terrific. So the book travels through aqua green and blue, a memoir, absolutely uh, terrific. And, and just your first book, you're already working on the second book. Already working on the second one. It's going to be called Designing Your Silver Linings Playbook, A Guide to Thriving like in Difficult it. Times. <laughs> I love it. Will we see a book of poetry at some point? Yes. I, you know, I've been thinking about that. And there are, you know, I probably have about 40 poems 
at the yeah. moment. And um, yeah, I think that that could, that would come out and I'm going to keep writing and I have my, my writing board on the side here and I'm working on one right now. And um, yeah, it's exciting. I, I, I love um, writing poetry. That is just a yeah. wonderful place to be. You just learn so much about yourself and humanity. Um, when you're, when you're forced with that big white pad, that's what I write on this big white pad. And um, I'm like, how can I give or, or how, how am I feeling today? Um, and that's pretty much where I like to write is it's I, my tagline is my writing your heart is what I want. to. I love that. Do. Yeah. I love that. Are you creative in any other way? Do you paint? Do you, do, are you musical? Any other creativity? Um, I wish I was musical. I have a keyboard in my uh, office that I want to <laughs> learn how to play because my dad played the organ and yeah. um, it was really so amazing. And um, on my father's side, there's tons of musicians, um, but I didn't grow up in any music classes. Right. Uh, the right. first year I was going to take music, they cut the budget. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we didn't, I didn't do it, but that shouldn't have stopped me. I just haven't picked it up uh, yet, but creativity wise, I love um, just Honestly, maybe writing is the most creative I am, but in work, yes. I solve really hard problems creatively. Um, and so I like to use use my powers that way as well. Uh, <laughs> and I dabble a little in painting. It's just beginning. I think if I, once I retire, I might, you know. That's good. That's good. I found that, that creative people tend to be creative in a few different areas. That's great. That's great. Well, well Mary, so before I let you go, Go through, you know, your social media and where we can go to purchase the book. Yes, well, definitely you can go to Amazon to purchase the book or Barnes and Nobles or uh, any place like that. Uh, social media, I am on Twitter. So Miss Mary E. Gregory, uh, it's MS Mary E. Gregory. And then on Instagram, I am Mary E. Gregory author. So those are my main platforms. You could probably find me on Facebook, but I don't have any major <laughs> Facebook page. Uh, but no, I would love to hear from people. Um, also, you can always email me at info at maryegregory.com. And I love hearing from people about their experiences of reading the book. And if, it, you, know, if you read it and it touches you, uh, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Is, is maryegregory.com the website? Yes, maryegregory.com. Okay. Yeah, very good, very good. Well, thank you so much, Mary. This has been a blast. And you absolutely have to come back when, when the second book's ready to go or when somebody's smart and actually picks this up. You got to come back and talk about it. Oh, absolutely. You got it. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> this has been really wonderful, Mike. It's so amazing to meet you. Your wife is incredible. <laughs> yeah, as you she's already the know. star of this family, for sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, I'll give her the credit for setting this up, but absolutely been a blast. I'm so glad she did. So great to meet you. Thank okay. You. Hold on one second. Well, that was, that was so much fun. I, is Mary is such an inspirational person. I, I'm so happy that, that we were able to do that uh, interview. Um, the book is amazing. So please take take the time, do yourself a favor, uh, read the book. It'll uh, it'll touch you. It'll inspire you. It's it's so well written. You know, it, we talked a little bit about her descriptions and how it makes you feel like you're you're right there. You know, in the room. Um, absolutely worth it. Just uh, just an amazing writer, an amazing story, and and it's it, it to me so. Uh, inspiring what she has overcome to get to the point that she had, is at in her life. So do yourself a favor, check out the book. Absolutely terrific. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I, that was a fun one uh, for me. I always enjoy talking with uh, talented, interesting people. Mary definitely fits the bill. So thank you guys so much. I was stumbling around just a little bit, but hopefully you enjoyed uh, the interview. It was, it was, it was really uh, a lot of a lot of fun for me. If you haven't done so yet, please take a moment. Go to our YouTube channel. We could use the help. It's under MeisterCon Pod. Please subscribe. We could use that uh, that help. 
You can also find all 300 plus episodes, audio and video on our website, meistercon.com. You can check that out there. There's a, a terrific fun blog from Brett. Uh, it'll let you know if we're doing anything uh, at the studio, in studio, or if we're traveling to any conventions, it'll all be on the website, meistercon.com. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to Mary. Until next time. Bye, everybody.